go. Yep. Hello, everybody. Michelangelo Badio with the live stream here. I have a very special guest today, and uh, this is uh, his name is Adam Adam Tureski, and he is one of my students back in the day. This is right after I graduated college, and uh, we're talking the very early '80s, and. Uh, it was during the era that I taught Tom Morello, and the thing that, uh, what, how it worked out was, we were looking for a video tech, and then you know Adam and I are friends on Facebook and Instagram, and then you know I, and then so, you know he's great at doing audio and video and things, so it all kind of worked out. But I thought it would be great to have him here. He's a he's a, a great guitar player. Uh, he's a really good friend. We've known each other for many years, obviously, and. He has literally everything that I wrote out for him back in the day. And, you know, so before we get too far into things, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the guitar first, and then we can start. Uh, then I want to hear your story, okay? Sure. And I know hello everybody guitar does fans. too. First of all, the shout outs. I'd like to say uh, hello to everybody who's on Bob, John, uh, Lyle, uh, let's see who else, uh, Roxana. Um, Let's see, who else? Oh, there's a lot of people. Uh, Tanya, Alexis, Denny, Brett, uh, Nick, Miss Metal from Instagram. Uh, and uh, also, too, GoDPS, which is one of the companies with Sawtooth, the GoDPS Music Live app. Uh, you c I can't say enough about it. Download it. It's free. There's no, like, free for three months and you have to pay. But you can get discounts on gear. You can hear concerts. Uh, there's so much content on here. And today, I want to focus on. Now, what we did was uh, we do like a satin finish on this. So we have one in black and one in white. And it's ironic. A lot of companies are coming out with this. I'm not saying Sawtooth invented it. I don't mean that. But in the era of everybody trying to figure out what's selling, we start putting this stuff out. And, and the floodgates open, but this is a really great guitar. I mean, it just sounds great. Uh, it's got medium jumbo flow. And of course, the Mikey string gaffer. All right. Now, Adam. It's time. Kind of, you know, tell your story. I'm going to shut up and let you talk yeah. here. So. How, did, how did Mike and I meet? Well, I'm sure there's a bunch of guitar players out here. Who have, when you first started, I started getting interested in music and guitar about 11, 12 years old, and I was absolutely obsessed with anything guitar-related. But back then, in the olden days, we really just had magazines. And I had another source to obsess over was the phone book. And that used to be like web pages for stores, and they would take out large ads and have gear logos on them. And I was obsessed looking at the major gear logos of a 14-year-old kid. I didn't have a guitar. I didn't have a car. I'm not going to these places. One day, mom had to go somewhere in Libertyville, which of all places, in Illinois, state in of Libertyville, Illinois. Illinois, outside of Chicago, is where this all happened. And I knew that there was a music store up there called Gann Music and Sound, and they had Gibson and Marshall equipment. And Boy, did I want to see that. So I begged Mom, I'll go help her at the errand if we can stop and look at guitars on the way back. So we do, and we walk in the store, and we meet a guy named Keith Marks who's selling guitars there. Yeah, Keith, good buddy. And uh, he shows me how to play Van Halen Unchained. And Mom actually recognized that song. Anyway, just kidding. That, exactly, and he handed me the guitar, and I mimicked it. Mom caught on and was like, can you teach him to do more of that? And he's like, well... I don't teach lessons, and we're not set up here at this store for it. But don't tell my boss, Gary Gann, but our competitor up the road, the music gallery, has got a friend of mine named Mike Badio who's giving lessons, and he may have a slot open. So when we got home, Mom called the music gallery, and my time was set up. I was Mondays at 3 p.m., and we would sit. That's when I first started. You were the first lesson. Re yes, yeah. I remember you would yeah. always arrive. Yeah, 3 to 8, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we would sit right like this in a little room in there, and I would bring in, um, I think he asked me to bring a booklet in, and he would teach me songs to play. And you have the famous line in the video of uh, keys to the Lamborghini. Well, keys to cars, I got the whip for the buggy. 
<laughs> pen and paper. So contained in here is about 60 pages of handwritten Mike Badio transcriptions from my lessons. I'm sure some of your fans are probably like, yes, yeah, can, I, can I mention one thing? Sure. You know, we're talking about a store called the Music Gallery. Uh, I met Frank, the owner, when I was 16. And I was actually the very first guitar teacher there. They were in Highwood. Then they moved to a really, it's a very upscale area called Highland Park. It would be the equivalent of like Beverly Hills in California. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, like, like people like Adam, I, I seem to, the students back then, like I haven't kept in touch with a lot of them, but the ones that I have, it's always about music. And, and the music gallery is still there. I mean, they are still doing great, and uh, where Gary Gand is no longer. Uh, but I like that store too. But but the music gallery is iconic, and, and uh, you know it's just fun. When you said 3 p.m., that was the first lesson. 3 yeah. p.m. lessons on yeah. Monday. It was my yeah. time with Mike. Yeah. Um, Gary Gand follows me on Instagram. He's still around. I talked to him. Yeah, I like Gary. Yeah, he's good. And guy. I go to the music gallery today. It is there. Uh, Pete Quinn is a luthier that works there, and he does my frets and sets up my guitars. And I yeah, yeah, it's great. So continue. Back to the book, I'm sure some of your fans are probably like, this is the most important paper document on Earth. So what was the very first lesson? I don't know if this is going to show on the camera. If it does, not That's we're my writing. It. it was 81 or 82? 1981, I okay, started. I, I remember thought. it being the fall because it got, this is yeah. not going to pick it up. So if you can't see the tablature written by Michael himself, it's uh, Hair of the Dog. I was very much into the Nazareth cassette that day. <laughs> and he transcribed that out for me, showed me tablature. I've been going yes. through this for the past now, couple of days. Now, here's one of the things that, uh, two, three, four, five, six. Um, tablature really wasn't that well known no. back then. You know, like a lot of books I have from that day are in, are in standard notation. So there were no software programs. But one of the things that Adam wanted to know, which I think is the reason why he's such a good guitar player and still plays today, is that I divided, I asked him what he wanted to learn, which are all these songs. But then I also gave him things he needed to learn. And uh, it's nice to see this because all the things I've said over the years are corroborated right here. You know, so it's a, uh, this is the real deal. Pick up and down. <laughs> Second lesson. A blue scale, the A yes. blue scale circled the root notes. Yes, yeah. And then showed me how to play the lead guitar solo for Slow Ride by Foghat. I love that song, Slow Ride. Yeah, I used to love figuring out songs. I did. It, it was good for my... I really put you to work in this thing. I was surprised. I haven't looked in this, at this for maybe 20 years. It's, I knew exactly where it was, and I've been going through it for the past... I'm, holy cow. This is like... Who was it? Wolf Marshall for Guitar for the Yeah, Wolf and I are friends. Who I know transcribed all this stuff? Well, I had Mike do... It's you know what i got to say? Work in here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to blow my own horn here, but this is Number of the Beast. Okay, so if you can see this up close, there's really not many mistakes there either. They're almost <laughs> not. I was pretty accurate in the transcription. And you did it in 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, we would. I would write this out during the lesson. Yeah, you know, um, so so if and, and it's not sloppy. It's really neat, and they're virtually. You know, you look at it. Just there's not any where I crossed it out or you know said oh this is a mistake. It's funny I mean, you wrote this as Scorpions, and I had to look at what is this? It's not title, but it's the guitar solo to No One Like You. Oh, there's yeah, <laughs> I love it. Which this is all dated because I think our lessons went. I started in 1981 and went all the way through. This was about a year. I thought maybe I compressed time, but it went till when you left for Los Angeles, which it, must right. have been late summer of '82. Yeah, because right after that, um, I, I had I had started planning my move to LA in '82, and then um, you know it was it was like at the tail end of the teaching part for me, and then I moved to LA, and then a year later I got in the band Holland. But I really love seeing this. I mean, Adam's a killer guitar player. And uh, you, the irony of it, too, when we did the Smashing Pumpkins show, you were working that show, too. About three weeks ago, the strangest vortex of coincidences all happened to me. So I have to give a shout out to, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for a dear friend, Victor Salazar of Vic's Drum Shop. Love you, buddy. Who kind of set me up on a, uh, the pandemic has found me in, um, well, I'm now self-employed, I would say. And he had a little, uh, He's Jimmy Chamberlain's drum tech of the Smashing Jimmy's Pumpkins. Jimmy's amazing, yeah. amazing drummer. And they were doing, if you don't know, they played Riot Fest and had to do a rehearsal. And Vic hired me to be the showrunner for their rehearsals. And the Smashing Pumpkins decided to have a special guest guitar player <laughs> for their show. And then Vic and I were working down on the floor, and there's this little half stack. It's I'm not on the comments. stage. Uh -huh. 
And I'm like, what's that for? And Vic looks at me and he goes, oh, that's for the guest guitar player. And we didn't say anything more about it and both get called away. And I go home that night and Mike announces on his social media that he's the guest guitar player with the Smashing Pumpkins where I'm temporarily working. And I'm like, I can't believe this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the irony of the whole thing, you know, that here, you know, we get together after all these years and, you know, he's a video tech, so we're able to do these multi streams. And, uh, but, you know, I think one of the things that, that I really like, I mean, his technique is really good. He's a really good alternate picker. I wonder why that is. What's that? <laughs> I wonder why that yeah, is. Yeah, and but you know, he's still actively playing in a band. And so these things that I've talked about in instructional programs, it's not just all lip service. You know, it's what I really do and what I really practice. And uh, so, uh, let's see. Somebody said there's hissing in the background. Uh, I don't know what we can do with that. Maybe it's yeah, it's because of the mic system we got. We really need two lapel mics. We're using a microphone that's right in front. We've got it really cranked up. Yeah, so. yeah, we have a yeah, it's a condenser. So all right, uh, you want to continue with the story or? So what? After that, we first had. This was also about the time that you said you were teaching Tom Morello. Yeah, LA. yeah. And I looked. Tom's about four years older than me, so I think that happened a little earlier. You started teaching. In like 1978, was it? 79? Yeah. yeah. And I met you in 81, so I think Tom might have, because I was like, when he mentioned that online, I was like, wow, he might have, he might have passed. Yeah. Passed, but you I, know, I, I think it was a little earlier. Well, you know, and I didn't give, you know, you, you were, you were a student for a while, you know, so I knew, I knew your name, like it got ingrained in my head, you know, so with Tom, I didn't even know I had taught him. And so he came up to me at a, a music show, the NAMM show, and I'm, this was literally in the 90s and, and late 90s, and I'm just standing around, you know, signing autographs and hanging out. And Tom comes up to me and he goes, Thank you, Michael. I go, What? And I looked at his badge when it said Tom Rowan Gold. I'm thinking, Thank you for what? You know, I'm thinking, man, he's going to say, Oh, I, I studied Speed Kills. And when he mentioned the music gallery, it blew my mind. You know, but what he said because was... Because he grew up and lived in all places, if you remember me mentioning, Libertyville. Libertyville, Illinois. that's right. Yeah, he lived really close. And, and uh, But the irony of it was that he gave his students the initial sheets that I gave him. Wow. You know, but, but I have to say, you know, I was very good at writing tablature, and, and I really, I liked it because it made sense to me. It, it was a no-brainer to tell somebody not to play an E on the fourth string second fret, but to play the E on the fifth string seventh, or the 12th fret on the 6th, and uh, it just seemed the proper way. But, uh, and you know, it's great to see that, uh, you know, when someone said, okay, Tom Morello, four years older than you on the left? Yeah, he is, right? I looked it up today just to make sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, somebody's like, like saying some guy named Matt, what, you don't believe it? But well, who cares thank you, I you think. Don't uh, no, I, no, I think he's I don't care if you believe it or not. You know, the sun rises in the east. I don't believe it. Well, I'm sorry, dude. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. You were a kid when uh, when I taught you. I, mean, I was. Yeah, it was funny too. There weren't many female students back then, but I did have a couple. Uh, one more. Her name was. Uh, her nickname was Bernie, and she went on to be in a local band called Tough Love. And I the thing that I is. told her is what all the girls do now. I told Bernie. I said. One of the things that you have to do is you have to play hard. Because a lot of times, females at that time, not on other instru instruments, not orchestral instruments, but on guitar, they would play really light and tentative. Somebody says uh, distractions in and around, you work around. Um, anyway, I'll try to answer that question. But, but one of the things that I showed Bernie is that to dig in and play. <laughs> girl online's aggressive. I mean, you know, the, that's what happened in violin. You know, when you audition for a symphony orchestra, they don't look at whether your gender, you know, uh, they just look at what they, they listen to what you sound like. And the playing field's been even for a long time with men and women in that genre of music, classical or orchestral, but it hasn't been in rock. Uh, and now it is. And, and you know, guitar. Uh, I can back you up that he absolutely teaches that, and he did that when I was 12. When I first came to him, I remember I was using Fender Medium Picks because I didn't really know how to pick. 
And what I was doing, I was trying to play the fast part of the eruption guitar solo. And what Michael saw that I was doing, I re recall doing this, is I was playing with the physics of the spronginess of the pick. So I was like dribbling the pick on the string, making it flick up and down. And I remember very clearly of going, you know, this is, would be a much more accurate and better way to play fast. And that's when he handed me the Jazz 3. So, and I still Picture use that. I still use this today. I wish I still had the one you gave me, but obviously that is yeah, long gone. And I remember he showed me how to put my hand on it, rest your palm on the bridge, and then pick up and down with definition. And I know there's a guy who interviewed you who goes so deep into this, Troy Grady. Oh, yeah, Troy. He's analyzed me to the nth degree. And everybody, I was almost afraid to watch his videos because I can pick well, and I, I didn't want to know how the sausage is made, so I didn't even want to look, watch those videos to deconstruct what it is I'm doing because I could do it. But I remember, like, it was, you have to pick with definition and force. And that yeah. Was exactly yeah, you what have to play hard. I mean, even if you're, even if you're playing slow. <laughs> You know, whatever you do, you have to play it with conviction. And, you know, if you play too light and wait. <laughs> not really going to to give you the definition you have. Um, so, Adam, do you want to continue on the story? And There's more know, story. We've gotten, insights. Uh -huh. we've gotten to, uh, yeah, the part, from, if you recall, how I, we can go into how I, you, you always talk recently about these things, about how music is a common thread to keep people connected. How in the world do I know Victor Salazar? Well, for a, after a while, Mike got poached from the music gallery to go over to the new Dan Music and Sound Store, and they started doing lessons there. Keith Marks still worked there. Coincidentally enough, about 10 years later, Keith Marks is do, isn't selling guitars anymore. He's running Cartage for drummers, huge, guitar huge, players. Huge, Cartage company. One of the drummers that winds up hiring him is a high school classmate of mine named Todd Zuckerman, yeah, who you may Sticks. know went on to play in drums and sticks, which he currently does for about 25 years. Vic Salazar is very good friends with Todd Zuckerman. I have kept in touch all these years with Todd. He went, we went to high school together. He's the year behind me. And we reconnected, and I've stayed in connection with Mike, but that's how that whole circle got, came together. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> hey, no, I'm just saying it, it's a small musical world, you know. I, I was telling Adam that, for example, my entertainment attorney, my intellectual properties attorney, was one of my students. Glenn Rice, and he's like the head of a, you know, he's a, you know, a partner in one of the top law firms in Chicago. I mean, big dollar law firm. And, you know, we met teaching. Uh, I remember I had another student named Jordan Lurie, and, and I knew that I had, see, I didn't know you was just Adam, it was Adam Turetsky. See, I, I knew, like, both names that, like, I'll never forget your name for as long as I live. And it's like, when I get the names ingrained in my head, and then what I used to do teaching was I would write down what I gave people because I, I know that it's easy. Like if you don't practice, if I gave you too much one week and you didn't practice everything, I would know what you did and what you didn't. Because a lot of times teachers we, will assign these things and then they'll forget what they even assigned. I didn't do that, I wrote it down. But um, one of the things with music is that a lot of the students that I, I had, some went on to become professional musicians, but most of them, and because I was teaching in an affluent area, became doctors, attorneys, and you know, you find, you know, I've run across people all over, all over the United States. You know, they don't live here in Chicago anymore. You know, I'll be in Arizona. Michael, you were my guitar teacher, man. And, you know, and then you know, you find they're a pilot or something, and you know, it's really fulfilling. But music is the common—I don't want to say commonality, but it's the thread that binds us all together here. Which is why, how did I wind 40 up? Forty years here? later, you know, we're still like talking. thanks to the internet. I kept in touch with you. But how did I wind up sitting here? So we're at the Smashing Pumpkins thing. You're about to come the next day. 
not only do I come home to work for that, but I get an email from another friend of yours, Doug Marks of Metal Method. Yeah. Mike's looking for an intern to run the computers that is for his live stream, and I've been a uh, computer administrator for 35 years. I specialize in Apple Macintosh, and that's what Mike's using. I'm like, I replied, I said, hey, I, I could do that. Mike's like, you're hired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I told Doug, he, he mentioned, like, there were several names already on there, and I see your name, I go, that's it. I go, I had a, and I told Doug, I said, you know, Adam and I have known each other, you know, since literally 40 years. And, uh, you know, someone mentioned about the double. Adam, can we show this real quick? We, we did a limited edition double guitar. We, have, we only did 50 pieces. A lot of them are gone. A few of them are left. And so um, if you are interested, we have somebody from Chromacast and Sawtooth online on here that's going to be, they can uh, put links up on the comments. But we're also multi-streaming it to uh, YouTube at the same time, so you can see this. But uh, yeah, it is a small musical world, as somebody said, named James said. Yeah, we have people from Germany, Munich. Yes, Coach, I love that beer, yes. Uh, yeah, and the church that's 400 years old that they still haven't finished. But anyway, the double is amazing. This isn't uh, quite the topic uh, of today, but we still have a few left, and it's only been out a week, and the majority are sold. But uh, it is just incredible. Also, I want to uh, just play a little bit on this one. <laughs> through this, but I use basic, simple drum software where you hear, like, I start at 185, and you hear, like, and it's just... That's 185. Then I go to 190, 195. Let's kick it up to 200. You see how clean that is, even at 200 BPM? And then you can do, uh, you know, then I bump it up to 25. I mean, it just goes on. And then uh, I bump it all the way to 220. 220 is great. So the idea is that what I do is I take drum programs and I start at a BPM, 185, 190, and then I'll even move it down sometimes to 175. One, two, three, four. See, somebody says 300 BPM. Uh, yeah, but I mean, that's really crazy. But what is it, 16th notes, 8th notes? You know, so it's 16th notes. Um, anyway, uh, Adam, let's continue your talk. I was going to ask you one other thing about this because it comes up a lot. In books. Do you remember giving out... Yeah, let's move on. Can we move a tiny bit closer to sure. the mic? Do you remember handing out other... I, I probably have it, but I can't find it. it. Every few pages, practice jazz chords. You must have given me something else because there's no jazz chords in the book. So there must have been some type of handout. No, hand I, I gave you a handout. It was, I did this, I have the program through Metal Method. It was 24 jazz progressions. Okay. It was a handout. Yeah, I've got it. So that must be what you're referring to. Yeah, that wasn't one something I wrote out. Like, uh, for example, uh, progression number one was the... <laughs> I had the uh, jazz progressions there. I used to take jazz guitar lessons when I was in college. But yeah, I said practice the jazz chords. Here's a great one. C sharp augmented 11th using your thumb. And 
Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it was a handout. Okay, yeah. that must be what it is. Yeah, I still have that. But I, I turned that handout, and see, even back then I talked about jazz scores. I turned that handout into 24 jazz progressions. Then I wrote another one, and it became 25 jazz progressions for Metal Method. Uh, I'll have to go look. We'll have that at another time, because I'm going to keep doing it. I saw somebody named Michael Foxworthy ask about, Michael. Are, you, are your fingers stiff when you start, and what do you do? Do you do something to warm up? And I remember this was preached to me by Michael back when I was a little kid about injuries, warming up, arthritis, and for my entire, I've played guitar since I was 12, I always used to do things like run my hands under warm water, always warm up, don't start shredding until it's been about five minutes. Yeah. And if you had more to go on with that. Yeah, okay, so I suggest starting at 235, 175 is too slow. Uh, I hate to tell you this, whoever's writing that, but that's just absolutely wrong. Um, and also, too, what what note uh, duration are you talking about? When you, somebody's saying start at 235, you don't start at 175. That's absolutely false, and I'll tell you why. Because in classical music, when you see the word presto, which, you know, uh, andante, uh, presto in classical music is usually around 190 BPM to 204. Anything above 220 doing 16th notes is almost to the point where who cares? Uh, and, and so, you know, somebody could say, dude, 300 BPM, bro! And they're doing eighth notes. It, you know, what, what I value, the note durations, meaning the note values, 16th notes, if you start at 175, 180, you're gonna find that is the beginning of the shred zone. When you get into the 200, 200, 204 is about the top on a classical metronome. So anybody that says start at 275, well, what do you start at, eighth notes? Well, if you start at eighth notes at 275, just do the common math, okay? So you're looking at, well, what's 75? So you're looking at 137.5 BPM on 16th notes. If you wanna play at 137, that's not that fast. 137.5 to be exact. It is 16th notes. So you can ramp up a metronome to 1,000 BPM, but you might play quarter notes. Dude, I played 1,000! You know, it's just for, uh, uh, but it is for 16th notes. So you want to get a groups of fours up. <laughs> Just put on 175. I'll just show you. This is 175. It's not that fast, okay? But it's a nice warm up. When I warm up, what I do is like what I say. I use a little, the Lamborghini runs really fast, but it takes a little while to warm up the engine. So I practice slow, and I always have, like, Adam's got really good hand technique. This is one thing I preach, have good hand technique. And so, and I'll do it clean. So don't use the distorted sound. Do that. Yeah, I use a clean sound a lot when I practice. We're reading your questions here in the chat. Okay. We can see both the YouTube and Okay. Facebook. Anyway, all I'm going to tell you guys, if I see comments like this where it's disparaging remarks, like a few of these, this guy's trying to tell me how to practice, I'm sorry. What I do works, and not only what I do works, uh, it's worked for centuries with classical piano. So anybody wants to argue it, let them argue it. Go somewhere else. Go to a chat room and blow your brains out, you know, and, you know, postulating and, and uh, you know, uh, being a pundit about how your method works amazing. Go for it, you know, but don't come to my house and do that. Okay, anyway.
So I read an interesting thing I saw in here. You've never put dates down, but one day you did, May 3rd, 1982. You know what? That's your, I think that's your writing, isn't it? Nope. That's my writing now looks like his because oh, I okay. decided to copy Mike. Mike prints in all capital letters, and it's the coolest looking writing. And as soon as I didn't have to write cursive anymore, I have never written cursive again. I want to be like Mike, so I print all capital letters. Yeah, it does look like mine. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When I was in college, I, everybody uses uh, laptops. But I started, I, I was a very neat printer, but I never used uh, upper and lower case letter, letters. Uh, I, I never mixed them. I just used capitals. But I wrote really neatly and in good sentence structure and syntax. And my, my teachers never downgraded me for that because back in the day, you know, I mean, they don't even give ACT and SAT tests now. You know, everybody's got to be equal. But in my era, if you were in a music class, but you wrote a sentence wrong, you were downgraded. You know, it, just because you're in music doesn't mean you have to be a moron and can't write. And so we were graded on our sentence structure and syntax, so I had to make sure. But nobody ever downgraded me for, uh, for, for writing capital letters. You know, it's funny. So, you know, I got away with it because I couldn't remember all the time. So, okay. Uh, what do I think of Michael Romeo? Oh, I think he's great. Okay. Um, do you, you want to add some more to this, Adam? Or? I could probably get you to say some more things. So I remember when this, when sadly I could no longer take lessons from him. He, uh, he moved out to LA to, I guess, quote unquote, make it. And it actually did happen, and I recall when it happened because I was, I think I was 14 at the time, and you were about 26. Didn't quite ask him for his phone number, so we lost touch when he moved away. About two years went by, and he recorded the Holland album, but I had no idea what had happened to him. And that was on a metal radio station in Chicago that only played from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. WVVX. WVVX, and I think it was Scott Loftus was the DJ. And he said, here's a new song from a band called Holland that is in the area. So I think they did Wake Up the Neighborhood, which is kind of a comedic tune. But they're like, and local kid done good, Mike Badio plays on the album. And I heard that and was like, oh my God, he did it. And I remember asking my dad for the car and I said, I need to go to the record store right now. And I went out to a record city in Skokie and bought the Holland album, which I still have. And yep, there he is. That's how that happened. Yeah. You know, when I moved to LA, um, it took one year for me to get signed, one. And my goal was to move out to LA and get signed. Uh, to a major label. Holland was on Atlantic Records. It wasn't called Badio. There was a singer named Tom Holland, and he's not Spider-Man. And uh, it, it's a, uh, but you know, we had, our album was produced by Tom Worman, uh, who did Every Rose Has Its Thorn, Poison, Doc and Motley Crue, we're not gonna take it, all Tom Worman. He was one of the biggest producers of the 80s, right there with Mutt Lang and, uh, and, and a couple others. I mean, you know, all the biggest bands outside of Def Leppard and a few ACDC were done by Tom Worman, and he was our producer, and I got along with them great. Dwayne Barron, the engineer for our record, his first album was Quiet Riot, you know, uh, what is it called, Metal Health, Bang Your Head. So, and he was 21 at the time he did our album, but it was really, really a uh, uh, great album. That album album is awesome. I still listen to it today. It's on Spotify. Yeah, the yeah, the album's called Holland. Holland Little Monsters. Yeah, the album's called Little Monsters, and it really is a great record. And the production, it really holds up today. I mean, you know, and we didn't have that typical snare sound of the 80s that kind of gated. We had a really open, natural sound because that's where our drummer Brad played. It was a, it was very Van Halen like, with where the bass and the drums were really simple. The bass player had a great high voice like Michael Anthony, and we used it. And then you had this great singer, Tom. I mean, what an amazing singer. And, and me riffing out without a, a rhythm guitar, just this rock solid foundation. But the album's called Little Monsters. You can get it on Spotify. Uh, it's really, really great record. Yeah, I wonder if you can buy it on iTunes. I don't know. I think so. You know, Probably I don't make there. any money from it. Because I was stupid back then. <laughs> <laughs> All I wanted to do was make it. I didn't care if I got paid. That's Making it wasn't else. getting paid back then. I think that was everyone's goal. Yeah. I saw a question here. You have to palm mute so you don't bring it in out of two like. 
to that, but I don't remember you telling me how to palm you, although I remember it came up, I'm pretty sure Ain't Talking About Love is in here, and showing me how to play that, that was all Can the problem. Do you have that written down? I don't know, I okay. didn't look if I have, oh, Mean Street, there's the intro to Mean Street. Oh, da 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 yeah, and then also, here, let's show all them five, I don't know if it comes up. That's the A Dorian scale in the five position. I don't uh, know if they can see this, and the, um, I can, un unfortunately, we're looking at this on a delay, so it's going to take about a minute and a half before I can tell if this is even in focus. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, um, what I did was, even back then, I showed the five positions. Now, you can create more positions than five. What I did is I had a little different idea of it than a lot of people. I didn't break it down into seven or eight little groups. I broke it down into every note on the fretboard and each position where you could play those notes. So it's a little different way of thinking about it, but the way that I thought about it then is the way that I think about it now. So, you know, one of the things that I was really happy to have Adam come on here is just to show that it corroborates all the things I've said over the years. This isn't like, I didn't make this stuff up or try to get clicks online or, or try to make money teaching these are concepts that I've had my whole life and so you know I mean I'm not a rocket scientist and I did I'm not Captain Kirk going up in space like I like lately or William Shatner but when it comes to music and lessons this is my area of expertise so if somebody comes up and says well you don't practice at 175 now you practice at like 375 it's too slow they just don't know let them do what they want but that is not the way my way's proven and I'm living proof of it. Adam's living proof of it. I mean, he's a ripping guitar player. And, and so, and, and I took ideas from orchestral music. My methodology is not just mine. It's a methodology taken from centuries of how to teach keyboard instruments because guitar wasn't, guitar was the lute. Guitar was a, a, it was a background chordal instrument up until it became electric. So the electric guitar is really the most popular instrument on the world. Well, guitar I love, uh, guitar in general, uh, you have to add acoustic. But it's the newest in main instrument on the planet. So we didn't have a lot of books on electric guitar because it hadn't been invented until the 20th century. And so a lot different thinking, but you know, my thinking goes back way longer than that, way before any of us here and our great, great grandparents were born. So it, it comes from just understanding how did Bach learn, how did Mozart learn, you know, how did Shostakovich learn or Cerny? So that's what I applied in my teaching. So anyway. Um, I see a whole bunch of people are asking to let me play. That may happen at a different time because hopefully this is not the last time I'll be in this room for these live streams. I'm going to go back to being behind the camera, but we'll do another one and I will pick up a guitar and we can show you what he taught me. In the meantime, if you would like to see me play, you can go onto my social media it's T-U-R-K-C-H-G-O at all the cool spots, Twitter, Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. There's examples of some of what I'm doing on there. Or I'm in a band. We're called Indonesian Junk. And I'm going to shout out to my bandmates, Daniel, Johnny, and Mike. Not that Mike. Um, go look us up, Indonesian Junk Band on Google. You'll find us. We're playing a couple more shows in November. we got some in December, mostly in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin area. So. If you live in Milwaukee, Kenosha, near Stevens Point or Detroit, you can come see me play. Great. Yes. And one thing I want to point out, too, 
one of the things, you know, I know some people are complaining about the audio. We have a mic over here. We'll, we'll adjust this stuff. We're multi-streaming. You know, it's an ongoing process. Uh, but I read some of these comments from you out there. And one of the things I would never do that I see here, I never make A, disparaging remarks about people, but B, when you're teaching somebody, you want to build them up, not tear them down. And so uh, when I would teach guitar, I wouldn't say, oh, you're doing this wrong, or my method is this or this. I, I mean, that's narcissistic. Now, we're all a little bit narcissistic. I think you have to believe in yourself. But my way of thinking about it is that you encourage people by pointing, by you can, you can point them in the, in the right direction without telling them they're doing something wrong. And, and so, again, that's just my philosophy of it. But, you know, I'm not an argumentative person by nature, but I'm also one that doesn't take BS when I, when I read or hear it. And when it comes to music, this is my area. I'm the rocket scientist in this, in this venue. A and, uh, you know, I mean, you can talk with me about music theory. You can talk about technique. I'm living proof. I practice what I preach. And what Adam has in this book from 40 years ago is still what I taught. You know, I, it's just crazy. Because, I mean, and you still got your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Very lucky in the gene pool on that one. Yeah, That's yeah. My brother yeah, has a little. You know, but uh, it, it's a, you know, and the thing is, you know, if you genuinely like people and genuinely want to help, and, and you have your 10,000 hours in, which I truly believe, you need that experience. You know, because it's kind of like, to me, teaching guitar is like getting a personal training. If you've got a guy or a girl who's ripped and buffed and in really great shape, I'll listen to them. But if I see a personal trainer that, that looks like they've eaten a few too many Big Macs, the last thing I'm going to do is listen to them when they're telling me how I should do my thing. Or, or like somebody doing yoga that can't do splits and can't do, you know, it's like you've kind of got to look at, like, who is this person? Just because they're a teacher, does that mean you're good? Does that mean you're knowledgeable? Or does that mean you just want to tell people what's on your mind? And, and so, you know, I just try to be a, uh, you know, as, as impartial as possible. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I have no prejudice against any technique or anything. Like all the songs Adam wanted to learn, not every band was my favorite band, but he also had the scales and the other things, what you want to learn and what you need to learn. And when you balance those two. That was a big part of what he said too when he would, it seems when you look at the book, he did nothing but uh, teach me songs. But, you know, why didn't you develop your ear and get them better? I eventually did, but what he'd always do is teach me a song and immediately start talking. He didn't write it down, but I remember him talking about it. Immediately start talking about how, say, the blues scale relates to this. How this song is good to play over because it's a one-four-five progression, and this is how you apply this scale, which you kept kept writing down, and that's how that worked. Yes. So he absolutely did that for 40 years ago. Yeah. Well, I want to just say this. Um, Sawtooth makes great guitars. I mean, this guitar sounds amazing. Uh, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of playthroughs. They the first time ever on a double guitar. Uh, Go DPS uh, Music Live app, it's unequaled. I mean, not many companies have an app like we do and, and, and have such diverse performers and, and, and all sorts of content and discounts on, on equipment. But also, too, you can go to my YouTube channel. Like Adam said, go to his. And I highly recommend what, what, what all the lessons that Adam had and what I taught then uh, evolved into Metal Method. So it evolved into Speed Kills. Uh, it, was, I, it was just a continuation of that. So if you're really interested in my instructional program, go to Metal Method. I mean, Doug Marks has a lot of programs himself. He's brilliant at this. I, he's probably taught more people how to play than almost anyone on planet Earth. And uh, we've been partners in this, you know, with my programs forever. Doug's programs are great, metalmethod.com. I have the package of all three many years later. I remember that. Troy Grady had a video about Metal Method. I thought something very funny that he had in passing about in the late 80s, those first, you couldn't get those video cassettes everywhere. They were they started to show up in the guitar stores. They were a little expensive. You had to pick which one you want, and there was a huge selection. Anyway, yeah. many years later, you can now download them at his website, and I bought the three video package and worked a little bit through the first Speed Kills, but I'm like, I got the Speed Kills right here. Really. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, and I, I hope you got something out of this, because... Uh, we're going to bring Adam back, and, and you're going to have to play guitar. He, 
he is a, a certain type of guitar player, has a certain brand that he uses, and uh, we're going to bring him on, but he ripped, I'm just telling you, he ripped, you're going to see it. So we'll bring him on again playing-wise. You know, we wanted to, the first time, just kind of, he's been the video tech, getting all these multi-streams together, and, and uh, you know, he's just a great player, a great friend of mine, and uh, I can't say enough about it, but I wanted to just tell you that, you know, it's easy for people to talk. Anybody can talk. I do this. I can do that. I can do this. It's another thing. We'll do it. Shut up and do it. You know, or like, you know, when somebody shouts out numbers, 375, 400 BPM, what does that mean? What note durations are you using? 300 at a, at a quarter note is only 150, you know, and so you have to kind of think about um, what exactly, or eighth notes, I mean at 150. And so what exactly are you talking about and how specific are you going to get? I'm very specific about this stuff. And I'm just telling you, the classical metronome ends around 204, 205. That is considered presto. You very rarely see violin music anything above 210. 220 is maxing it out. I'm not saying there isn't, but you know when you're playing 16th notes at 220 like I did, it's blistering fast. How much faster do you need? You don't. Now, doesn't that mean, does that mean you don't want to play faster? Of course not. Somebody wants to play 16th at 230 or 240 or 250, you know, yeah, that's something I'm capable of, but it's also not necessary. I mean, Freight Train was only 200, and it sounds ferocious. And so I, I just look at what do you need and what exactly are you talking about? And I'm here to help, and what Adam has in those pages are exactly Today, I look back and say, that's it. That's what, it's right. And it's right because my degree in music showed me how the box, Beethoven's, and Mozart studied. So I used thinking from not just my age, my age group, but generations before me. And here, Adam, you're a generation, you're younger than I am, and you're still out there ripping. But we're gonna get Adam back and, and tear it up for you. I'm telling you, he's really good. And so you don't have to take my word for it. Tell them uh, your social media again. Yeah, so if you want to find me online, Instagram, Twitter, T-U-R-K-C-H-G-O. You can Google my name, and you'll probably get my Facebook page. Um, Google our band that I'm currently in. I also wanted to mention, you know, I'm currently self-employed, so I'm a hired gun. Uh, if you like what you see on there, get in touch. Cool. So anyway, I want to say I'm Michelangelo Badio. Adam Turetsky. And uh, we are sponsored here by Sawtooth Guitars. Chromacast and Go DPS Music Live. Uh, this guitar is at a really great discount. Um, it's amazing, top of the line Floyd Rose. Uh, a lot of features on it. This is my uh, MAB string dampener. It blocks the strings, so it makes it cleaner when you play. Kind of like when people use fret wraps, but I think this is a lot better because you can do this, whereas you can't with a fret wrap. Gotta stop right here. Anyway, thanks, I'm Michelangelo Badio. See ya. Now, if only he had someone over there that could stop the stream. That's okay. Oh. He's wearing snakeskin boots. It's cool. <laughs> That's what I'm for, so I'm going to get up and go stop the stream. See ya.